welcome to the 24-hour conference on global organized crime podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. The 24-hour conference on global organized crime took place online in November 2020 and was organized by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group, the Centre for Information and Research on Organized Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Hundreds of academics, researchers, journalists and others from around the world gathered together to present and discuss the latest research in organized crime. We've selected just 14 of them for this podcast series. But I would encourage you to head over to the website oc24.globalinitiative.net where you can find recordings of other sessions. In this episode, you'll hear the session Migration and Organised Crime. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session of the 24-hour conference on organised crime and this session on migration and organised crime. I'm Lucia Baird, Senior Analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime, a think tank that researches organised crime trends around the world and pilots programming responses, and I will be moderating the discussion today. First, some housekeeping rules, although I'm sure everybody is extremely familiar with Zoom by now. Uh, Please do stay on mute throughout the session. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentations, and we'll be taking questions through the chat function. Please do post your questions as the speakers are presenting, and I will be directing questions to speakers once uh, they have all finished speaking. Feel free to direct your query to a particular speaker or to the panel at large. This is a very interesting time to be speaking about migration and organised crime, partly because COVID-19 has constituted a key shock to global migration dynamics, both regular and irregular, and of course to the illicit markets that support irregular movement, principally human smuggling. As governments around the world have closed borders and funneled yet more resources into border control, it's a key moment to take stock and rethink whether current migration governance and responses to irregular migration and human smuggling are working. But before we leap into the substance of this session, I think it's key to flag that migration is not in itself a crime. And this seems like a very obvious point. However, as migration policy is increasingly framed through the lens of national security, particularly currently where irregular movement has been associated with contagion in the context of the pandemic, by extension, migrants and refugees are increasingly perceived as criminal. Not only is this morally concerning and evidentially unsubstantiated, but it threatens to erode the protections afforded to migrants and refugees under international and domestic laws. I'm delighted to be joined today by two speakers who will present on different aspects of this topic. Firstly, Dr. Veronica Nagy, who will explore the use of surveillance in migration governance, and also Sasha Jojvic, who will speak about organised crime and migration specifically in the Western Balkans. But first, I will um, launch into uh, the focus of my uh, presentation, which will be on human smuggling, one of the two key crimes associated with migration, the other being human trafficking. Um, But although human smugglers have facilitated uh, mobility around the world for a very long time, they first rose to prominence and became perceived as this highly organised criminal figure far more recently since the beginning of the 21st century, but particularly in the last decade. And this uh, perception has really driven a surge in criminal justice approaches to human smuggling. As I noted, the pandemic offers a perhaps unprecedented opportunity to track the impacts of responses which focus on border control. And in the economic distress following COVID, more people will need to move in search of livelihoods, but shrinking pathways for legal migration mean that a greater proportion of movement will be irregular and an increasingly hostile migration environment and harder borders to cross mean a greater reliance on smugglers. So we are likely to be emerging from the pandemic into a landscape with a more profitable and essential human smuggling industry. 
and one that poses greater risks for migrants and refugees using the services of smugglers. So this is a good time to stop and take stock of responses to date. And in order to start thinking um, towards uh, how res responses can be shaped, it's first key to understand the challenge that human smuggling poses and why current responses may in some cases have had limited success and also have had counterproductive impacts. And core to this understanding is that the smuggling industry operates as a supply and demand economy, with the demand being the migrants need for help to move and the supply being the smuggler services. Governments' responses have tended to focus on the supply side, targeting smugglers and applying criminal justice responses. Now, COVID-19 and state responses to the virus have really put two long recognized correlations into sharp relief. Firstly, between shrinking legal pathways for migration, of course, these almost vanished in the context of the pandemic, and a growing need to migrate irregularly. And secondly, because between increasing investment in border control to, in, to prevent irregular migration and an increased demand for smugglers. Now, in interviews conducted with migrants and refugees around the world, the Mixed Migration Centre found that on average 37% of respondents in September had identified a greater need for smugglers. This was significantly higher in West Africa and in Latin America. This was conducted as part of their 4MI data collection. Um, and enforcement can drive the smuggling market to shift and evolve towards a more exploitative manifestation where operating risk is higher as are risks to migrants. And in my research, I found there to be three broad phases that shift between phase one, which of low risk and low profits, um, then phase two, driven by enforcement action, which as uh, operating risk for the smuggler increases, and both bribe prices, because risk to officials go up, but also the prices for migrants increase, and the market as a whole becomes more profitable for human smugglers. If um, sustained enforcement keeps those risks high, then we shift into phase three and prices are kept high. And either um, if the demand is not flexible, so for example, in the context of refugees, the market remains where it is, highly criminalized, drawing large profits. But if the demand is flexible, it will drop and smugglers will then need to top up their revenue. And unfortunately, one of the ways that we have seen these top ups working in a range of jurisdictions and human smugglers is that smugglers try and get greater profits from a smaller number of migrants. And this can include uh, exploitation of migrants, often in contexts that constitute trafficking. So as a broad point, one of the counterproductive impacts of um, certain forms of enforcement against the smuggling industry is that it can lead to higher costs and risks to migrants. So turning first to price, to take one non-pandemic example, in Niger between 2015 and December 2019, prices increased five, fivefold in line with greater enforcement for foreign migrants crossing um, the desert into Libya. Now, in the context of COVID, the four MI surveys conduct, conducted with migrants and refugees across the world uh, noted that over half of respondents um, tracked an increase in the prices that they were paying for smuggling journeys. We have to bear in mind that this is not uh, purely because of heightened enforcement action, and there are a number of other factors at play, um, including heightened demand for smugglers. Now, in the context, um, in, in this context, the smuggling journey also becomes much more dangerous for migrants as the operating risk for smugglers has increased, partly because smugglers are forced to take riskier routes and act more clandestinely to avoid detection. Now, a recent tragedy in Mozambique where 64 Ethiopian men were found dead in the back of a lorry container on 24th of March really brings this into relief. And the date is important here because it was four days after the Mozambique government imposed strict border controls to prevent any unnecessary movement of people in response to the pandemic, as did governments across the world. It's believed that these migrants and refugees were being smuggled across the popular southern route towards South Africa and um, the enhanced border security measures in Mozambique, as in elsewhere, will drive other smugglers that are seeking to move significant numbers of migrants and refugees across borders to adopt similar extremely risky approaches. 
So in this way, the journey itself becomes more dangerous. But also as the migration landscape becomes more hostile to migrants, um, we see not only that migrants become more reliant on smugglers and the exploitation of migrants by smugglers increases, but also that migrants are vulnerable um, to abuse from other actors, including through um, community attacks driven by fear and xenophobia. Now, a key point to bear in mind is that as there is greater law enforcement focus on human smuggling, it becomes much more difficult for smugglers to operate without state collusion. So this drives out poorly connected smugglers and really entrenches existing corruption structures. So this relationship between enhanced enforcement and greater reliance on state involvement is a really important one to bear in mind when crafting counter smuggling responses. So overall, we see the shift from a low level informal industry to a more profitable one and crucially journeys that are more dangerous to migrants. Now, that's not to say that criminal justice approaches are entirely obsolete and it's also important to operate within political realities and recognise that criminal justice approaches are likely to be around for a while. So to hone in slightly and show some of these tensions in the context of the African continent, um, the AU has a pan-African vision of open borders. However, to some extent, this stands at odds with members' emphasis on border control. And the slow ratification of the AU Freedom of Movement Protocol really demonstrates this. And so I use this to show that we're in um, a space of imperfect solutions and compromise and trying to make the response as good as we can. Now, the UN emphasizes that enacting laws criminalizing smuggling is a prerequisite to effective responses. I would add a caveat to say this is right to the extent these laws are drafted and implemented appropriately. If they are not, they can arm the wrong fight. Uh, the most comprehensive legal approach is set out in the UN Smuggling Protocol, enacted in 2004, um, and it specifies that the intent of the perpetrator must be for material or financial benefit, and this is crucial to retain the focus on the organised crime. Now, in my research, I found that 22 African states broadly comply with the protocol's obligation to criminalize the smuggling of migrants, but that there are a few concerning trends in these responses. Um, here, I would like to highlight three. Um, firstly, that smuggling offenses are often embedded within trafficking laws, which is damaging and uh, enhances the confusion between the two distinct uh, phenomena. Secondly, that often smuggling offences carry mandatory minimum sentencing frameworks. Um, 16 of the 22 states um, apply such mandatory minimum sentences. And this can really risk disproportionate harm to the type of low level smugglers that are typically the ones convicted for such offences. And thirdly, that one of the pillars of the smuggling protocol is to protect migrants. And therefore, it includes an explicit prohibition on the prosecution of migrants merely for using smuggler services. Unfortunately, only nine of the 22 states included this prohibition. So to conclude, in applying criminal justice responses, let's make sure that the tools and frameworks are appropriate so that, that the laws can effectively be used as part of a response and guide rightful perceptions of smuggling. Framing offences wrongly risks disproportionate harm to both migrants and low-level smugglers. But also, we must be sensitive to the potentially counterproductive impacts of counter-smuggling responses. And it's crucial to understand the relationships between smuggling and corruption. Finally, I wanted to raise a question, which is that we have long accepted under international law that human smuggling should be criminalised as a form of organised crime. Yet a growing body of research and evidence on the human smuggling industry suggests that the market is dominated by loosely affiliated individuals or organisations with limited hierarchy and in many cases structure. It's arguable that some of these would not even fall within the concept of organised crime as set out in the UN Transnational Organised Crime Convention. So should we continue to be perceiving all human smuggling operations as criminal and therefore immediately requiring criminalization and a criminal justice response? Or is there a call for a fundamental pivot in our understanding and a more nuanced approach? I have draw drawn on ongoing research in this presentation, but particularly on two recently published reports, one titled Human Smuggling in Africa, the creation of a criminalized economy, and also Smuggling in the Time of COVID-19, which are available on the Enact and Global Initiative website. Time is, as always, tight, so I encourage you to go and explore further. Um, thank you very much. 
and I will um, pass over to my colleague Veronica, um, who will speak to us a little bit about the role and the growing role of surveillance in migration governance. Uh, Dr. Veronica Nagy is Assistant Professor at the Willem Pomp Institute in Utrecht, um, and her research interests include surveillance, digital inequality with a focus on the connection between mobility and technology and the securitization of international migration and criminalization. Thank you and the floor is yours, Veronica. Thank you very much, Lucia, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my sh slides now. Um, and thank you for Lucia for taking this over. I mean, we are after a really long marathon of 22 hours almost, and I hope you are all still alive and awake. <clears throat> And there are many issues we have discussed before today. So I try to kind of um, link my, my topic to, uh, to this kind of uh, previously discussed uh, aspects of, uh, of the different roles of organized crime and different perceptions. But in general, in this panel, I would really would like to highlight the, the different opinions from the other side or from different stakeholders uh, engaged with this kind of <clears throat> concerns, what we uh, have the tendency to approach from a kind of um, um, polarized approach from law enforcement and refugees or law enforcement and migrants. So my general concern is, uh, since I'm engaged uh, as an ethnographer and anthropologist uh, in this chronological field from a digital perspective, uh, is that in my current um, research project, I try to explore those unintended consequences what already has been mentioned by Lucia, not just in terms of the measures we would have been taken and uh, the possible uh, risks and uh, legislative and criminalizing uh, processes we see globally, but also how the perceived uh, measures, how the perceived approaches in terms of invisibilities of surveillance are affecting the role and the interaction and the, <clears throat> the traditional move of uh, refugees uh, from particular uh, physical and geographical and geopolitical contexts. So what I'm working on lately is a really small bit of the current refugee, what we call crisis, uh, is in particularly the people on the move who are generally has been criticized and um, uh, targeted by different uh, media mi misrepresentations as a, a well-established um, network uh, and digitized and internet-connected network, uh, which is uh, really easily exploiting uh, by technologies or all kind of new smuggling and uh, even trafficking uh, networks, where the increasing overlap between uh, those who are taking advantage of the migration uh, or the um, uh, mobility process through smugglers or what they call um, um, different kind of assistance or family members and how they uh, how particular groups in these refugee networks are also taking over these roles uh, in different contexts. So for, for first of all, I would like to take, take a step back. I would like to push um, more uh, or, or pull your attention towards more the perceptions of refugees uh, who are engaged within uh, in these networks uh, in different social settings, uh, in particularly in the Balkan route, and how their perceptions on law enforcement and their perceptions on the surveillance technologies, in particularly of law enforcement, are shaping their communication on the move. Uh, in between uh, different uh, language networks, net different social media networks, and how these perceptions of surveillance and the fear of being targeted by law enforcement, repressions, and the different issues with um, the legislative, uh, local legislative responses from smuggling, trafficking, and anti-terrorism uh, approaches are changing their decision-making processes in different social contexts along different borders. So as I have said before, there is a really uh, strong uh, objective uh, of, of, there are several objectivities on how we construct uh, the idea of the connected migrant in a digital global world. And these perceptions also infiltrating our law enforcement practices that also on the same way, getting back to uh, different constructions of security and threat experienced by refugees on the move. So while I was talking and engaged with different refugee groups coming from 
in particularly Syria, Afghanistan and Iran, uh, traveling through uh, Turkey, uh, Greece, uh, the Balkan route of Serbia, Hungary, Germany, and hopefully reaching some of the countries what uh, has been perceived as one of the safest countries of the European um, um, mobility networks, you will see that these kind of perceptions are radically shifting and changing uh, on the move, uh, also through um, in time, but also due to those perceptions, what has been shared in these kind of digitalized connections developed by um, different stakeholders. And there I would like to emphasize the stakeholder bit, which I think hasn't been mentioned enough uh, in, these, in these discussions lately, how the information sharing, how the technologies employed and used and consumed by authorities, NGOs, produced by corporate companies, are affecting the, uh, the different types of approaches where these refugees are actually responding to in their uh, narratives and in their uh, conceptualization of local safety and security. So by doing digital ethnography, collecting a lot of visual, uh, visual data and uh, empirical data from uh, refugees on the move uh, in different uh, physical contexts, I would like to challenge those assumptions, what has been associated with the connected migrant and to better gain a better understanding of what the really, really uh, uh, um, re in a retrospect uh, define as um, um, a general concern in a particular uh, border crossing environment, in host society and a particular host community and which aspects are really playing a role when it's, the, when it's about um, uh, digital mobile devices that are used for different purposes. And the general assumption is, of course, that the purpose is to uh, resuscitate and leverage all social networks uh, to maintain uh, leverage contacts with potential employers, what we many times read in, in researches in uh, transit countries or to help refugees to maintain and leverage other external support networks um, or with the contacts with aid agencies or co collect and produce evidence what you have regularly heard from authorities working in the migration policy and um, refugee uh, uh, legislative frameworks uh, and, and uh, law enforcement practices. So what in general we see is, and I try to invite everybody in this field looking a little bit or extending the borders of traditional criminological approaches and look further from the traditional uh, organized crime narratives and see how the surveillance theories, media theories and mobility theories in particular uh, help us to understand what are the social dynamics uh, beside what Lucia has already mentioned on economic approaches uh, that really shape the emotional decision making, the security narratives, and uh, the, the, the different uh, pros and cons experienced and described and, and reshaped by uh, information sharing uh, in connected networks. So in this particular research, I would like to put the emphasis not on the general media related studies, what they share on uh, what they uh, re study on what people share on the move, but actually I'm curious about what people do not share. What are the topics? Uh, what are the subjects? What are the information facets or the feelings? Or what are the uh, channels in this multimedia environment what people avoid um, in order to uh, ensure safety and security on the move and how they justify these kind of decisions? So in this work, I would really would like to rely on my uh, theoretical framework on the art of real speech. So how this form of self-censorship we employ and you all employ now in your daily practices uh, when you are connected online uh, in different application groups on different social media platforms and even in your work environment, how these kind of uh, self-censorship processes are changing the current understanding of the techno-social refugee environment and also therefore the mobility of people in different contexts. So getting back to the, the, um, the core issue of the, diff the different role of current stakeholders in this field, let me please emphasize that I think we have um, uh, the tendency to forget the importance of the current 
service providers and the role of uh, technological uh, global companies that are actually facilitating our work in law enforcement practices. And how this kind of state corporate or governance corporate relations uh, uh, changing our views and changing the perceptions of refugees about surveillance technologies and the potential consequences of those. So when we hear the issues of uh, uh, ICE uh, produced by uh, corporates like Amazon, um, uh, Palantir, uh, the current experience and experiments actually on uh, refugees uh, with uh, biometric data registration systems as a financial uh, trans. Uh, uh, transmission form, you see that there are a competing, increasing interest in the field of surveillance, where people from the one, on the one hand try to ensure security of refugees, on the other hand uh, try to also, of course, uh, from uh, different uh, organized crime perspectives, uh, prevent and, uh, um, and also investigate uh, threat, uh, threat assessments of uh, different groups among refugees considered as a potential terrorist threat or organized crime threat. So you see that this shift in the different, uh, the importance of the cooperation between different stakeholders, in particular affecting their data exchange and their understanding of who we consider as um, a threatening refugee and who we consider as a, a vulnerable refugee. You see that these kind of narratives are shaped by uh, the, the databases that are provided between different geopolitical contexts um, or exchanged by different uh, um, organizations, which is intensely affecting the level of trust among not just the corporates, the law enforcement, NGOs, and general users, but in particular, the refugees and local services, service providers, and national um, uh, policing services and in particular state intelligence. So on the one hand, you see an increased police engagement with prevention and digital data extraction um, through corporate companies and also in collaboration with different NGOs developing applications, for instance, for these uh, refugees, which creates a new field and a new perception on how to ensure a safe trip for refugees, in particularly people coming uh, along the Balkan route. So you see that these self-censorship strategies, and I would like to close uh, this already too long presentation with the core aspects, what has been, I think, underestimated in this kind of responses uh, based on the social construction of surveillance threat. And these are how to avoid the risky channels, the risky contents, what has been considered as a personal, political, religious, or practical content that is from a Western perspective, from the host society considered as threatening and how the self-censorship of this kind of data is actually feeding into a more suspicious profile of the surveillance systems driven by self-learning self um, uh, algorithmic systems uh, creating different kind of profiles of refugees on the move along the different uh, EU borders and internal EU borders. So what you see is that uh, many uh, responses are already to become disconnected, um, to not being uh, connected by devices, by connected through devices. So people actually take distance from all kinds of devices on the move and change user identities regularly, select content in different stages and readjust it per border. So it's a really physically, con still physically contextualized decision-making process which is often uh, overseen or uh, underestimated when we talk about the techno-social aspects and the connectedness and the values of internet connected or social media connected refugees exchanging information about their safe mobilities along smuggling routes through different borders. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for being so brief. I hope it's uh, raised enough questions to, to continue it maybe later on uh, on this topic. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you, Veronica. Um, that certainly, that was a brilliant initial insight and I look forward to discussing more some of the themes that have come out of that presentation. 
and I encourage uh, the audience to please uh, post your questions in the chat either to everyone or um, to me privately and they will be directed at each of the speakers um, after our final speaker um, has finished. So now to offer again a slightly different perspective um, on migration and organized crime, um, I'm very pleased to present Sasha Djordjevic, who is field coordinator for Serbia and Montenegro for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Sasha um, has been researching organized crime and corruption in the Western Balkans for a long time. And before working with the Global Initiative, Sasha worked for almost 12 years as a researcher at the Serbian-based think tank, Belgrade Center for Security Policy, covering police reform, community policing, and hooliganism. Sasha, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for your kind uh, introduction. So I will, uh, I will speak in my presentation about the organized crime and uh, migration in the Western Balkans. So, and I, I, I will try to, to compare two crises. So basically the crisis in 2015 and the crisis, uh, current crisis of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, and trying to answer three main questions. So uh, what are the main migration routes in the Western Balkan six? Uh, what are the hotspots or popular crossing points for migrant smuggling? And what are the, the smuggling methods? But at, at the beginning, I think it's very important to just uh, say what is the Western Balkan Six. So basically it's a political neologism used to describe uh, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia in the context of the European Union enlargement process over the East. And the geographical position of the Western Balkan Six, which is Southeast Europe, uh, make is an essential path pathway for uh, organized crime activities including facilitation of illegal migration and that was on the top of the agenda especially in 2015 and uh, also right now and when we look uh, inside of the organized crime and the uh, uh, illegal uh, migration we can uh, say that from basically from the UNODC preliminary data shows that the type of organized crime attracting the most significant convictions in the western balkan six was actually migrant smuggling with around 60 percent so one zero percent of uh, all conviction following by the drug trafficking convictions with 10 percent of the total so basically uh, through this presentation i will try to compare routes hotspots and methods and through through crisis but first i, I think it's very important to hear some kind of uh, a human voice in this start. I will read uh, one excellent quote from the young boy from Afghanistan that explained the outstanding, uh, in the outstanding way, the phenomenon of illegal migration. So, and um, basically, migrants use the English word "the game" uh, for illegal border crossing, and the game for this young Afghanistan is as follows. So, he said, "I'm from Afghanistan. I am six, six, 17 years old." Three years ago, I first went to Pakistan. From Pakistan, I moved to Iran. So I worked in Iran and made some money. Then I moved to Turkey. I was in Turkey for two and a half years. I found a smuggler and paid for him. I crossed the Aegean Sea for eight hours at night. Then we were caught by the Greek police and I was imprisoned in the camp for three months. From there, I went to Macedonia by train. It was freight train and not a passenger train. And from Thessaloniki, I came to the Greek Macedonian border. Then a smuggler took us through the forest to Macedonia, and then we jumped on the train again and came to Serbia. I paid $1,500 to get from Afghanistan to Turkey, and from Turkey, 103,000 euros to get to Serbia. So basically, in this quote uh, from one doc documentary movie that was recently published uh, on the regional uh, television in the in the Western Balkans, actually you can we can see what are the moves, what are the methods, and what are the prices of the of the of the smuggling that it's and the, the nothing can happen without the so to say support of the organized uh, crime uh, crime uh, groups and their motives. So basically. Uh, because uh, one, what is the main motive to, for these migrant people is to actually get the better life, mostly in the 
uh, in the EU member states or the Norway or the Switzerland. So what are the main routes in, uh, in the Western Balkans? So basically, uh, there are two main migration routes and both have uh, been active for a long time and also active in during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis. So the first route begins in Albania, continuing to Montenegro, all through some irregular, irregular migrants also continue their travel to Kosovo and further to Serbia. But basically for Montenegro, uh, migrants mostly travel to Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to enter the EU via Croatia. And this route appears to be used mainly by people from Iraq and Syria, who are in some cases supported by regional active organized criminal groups. So it's not like national local supporters, but also regional uh, criminal groups with some connection also from the people from basically from Iraq and Syria. And the other main entry point for the Western Balkans is the North Macedonia. And this route has a, a high prevalence of uh, irregular, irregular migrants from Algeria, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. And in this part of the region, most uh, apprehended migrant smugglers are local opportunistic smugglers and regional organized crime groups, basically transferring the illegal migrants from Greece across, uh, across North Macedonia towards Serbia. And basically those, when those migrants came to Serbia, there are two branches of uh, directions. So some uh, migrants tried to enter the EU directly from Serbia to Croatia or Hungary. And in contrast, other moved to Bosnia and Herzegovina either directly or by uh, Montenegro to attempt to enter Croatia from that. So basically, Bosnia and Herzegovina is right now is a particular form of a bottleneck uh, because the, the Hungary, as you probably know, closed the border with fences. And actually, also there are fences also on the border between Serbia and North Macedonia. And basically, this is the only pathway for the migrants to, to go out to Bosnia and Herzegovina and from the Bosnia and Herzegovina to enter the Croatia. So many irregular migrants are stranded in the country. So basically, in the transit area, especially right now during the COVID, as a result of increased efforts of the authority to prevent crossing into the Croatia. And because of that, we also have the cases of police brutality, especially in Croatia, and uh, uh, illegal migrants continue to reach the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, basically both with Montenegro and Serbia. So what are the key hotspots? And this is based on the global initiative research uh, on uh, criminal hotspots uh, in the Western Balkans, but also where organized uh, criminal uh, groups from the Western Balkans with origin in the Western Balkans are, are active uh, throughout the world, and the third research is also uh, based on the on the illegal migration issue, especially in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Basically, the hotspots of uh, the key area or hotspot for gathering uh, irregular migrants, so basically our capitals in this country. This is, for example, Belgrade, Skopje, uh, Sarajevo, uh, uh, Podgorica, or places around the border. So this is the second uh, uh, top, second place where the the people uh, uh, from I don't know Syria, Afghanistan, etc. The migrants are basically uh, gathering and trying to uh, to introduce themselves to the smugglers or to trying to to catch uh, uh, to 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 catch the EU member member states. So. Basically, uh, so when we compare 2015, 2016, and right now 2020, so basically the Balkan migrant routes was closed in 2016 because of the uh, uh, stronger, stronger border control, but the smuggling of migrants has never stopped entirely. So even now we have also uh, examples of uh, uh, illegal migration in the region. So, for example, in 2015, during the migrant crisis, 1.3 million migrants and refugees sought asylum in the 28 European Union member states, Norway and Switzerland, so 28 at that time. And now, until October 2020, according to the Migration Flows web portal, more, almost uh, 60,000 migrants are registered 
most in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, for example, right now, I checked those data uh, last uh, night. So in Albania, uh, 3,000 uh, migrants are registered. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, is about uh, 10,000, so 14,000. In Kosovo, it's uh, uh, 2,100. In North Macedonia, more than 5,000. In Montenegro, it's 2,500. And in Serbia, it's more than 30,000 uh, registered migrants. Oh, so basically, the arrival of migrants and refugees in the Western Balkans so reduced, mainly during the time of the virus crisis. And uh, for example, the Frontex, which is the EU border control agency, announced that the lowest number of illegal migrants entering the EU it was basically during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since 2009, and that was the date where the, the largest uh, number of uh, illegal migrants entering the EU was in April 2020. So uh, I will, uh, in the week, so starting, so when we go back at the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, so in the week starting from uh, uh, the end of the March, the number of arrivals in Serbia fell by almost uh, 80 uh, percent compared to the previous week, so the, the middle of the March, and in the same period there were no al arrivals in Albania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, but only 14 new people came to Bosnia and Herzegovina. That was at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And the situation didn't change dr dramatically in the first 10 days of uh, April. Only Serbia registered the arrival of 24 new migrants and yeah, refugees, and that's data based on the International Organization for Migration. As you see, that number is right now is, is bigger than the, that at the beginning of COVID-19 crisis. So prices for illegal smuggling are higher. So according to the statements of migrants and activists for, uh, uh, that help on the ground uh, refugees and mi migrants, especially in Serbia and Montenegro, they say that the, the smuggling is basically flourishing the prices are quite higher and the smuggler charge uh, migrants uh, between 5,000 and 10,000 euros for illegal crossings. Also, we have new methods of smuggling. So uh, from 2015 until now, the migrant smugglers use different kinds of vehicle to transport illegal migrants in the region, in the Western Balkan six, uh, those basically cars, so minivans and trucks. So it's a common for criminals to use also rental vehicles or fake uh, license plates to decrease the likelihood of, of detection by the authorities, especially from the police and the uh, customs. And also what was the trend that locally, local taxi drivers also regularly transport uh, illegal migrants across the border. However, there are some new trends to cross the border because of the fence, especially between Serbia and Hungary. So at the beginning of October this year, 2020, Hungarian border police patrol discovered a new, basically a, a new tunnel, six in a row. So tunnel which is beneath underground, beneath the, the fence. It is long about 20 meters and which stretches under the protective fence on the Serbian Hungarian mass. And for, for example, if, uh, I think, uh, uh, in October, that uh, the Hungarian police actually catch uh, more than 100 uh, migrants using tunnel to, to cross uh, into the EU, in this case, in, in Hungary. So, and to end, to end, to conclude, so basically Turkey will remain the critical country along the eastern Mediterranean route for, uh, for illegal migration. Uh, as uh, in 2019, the Turkey Ministry of Interior estimated that around uh, 4.9 million migrants are present in Turkey. And migration in the Western Balkan region will continue to be influenced by, because of this uh, uh, number of people in Turkey to a larger extent, and, by the, and the second by the size of the flows along the Eastern Mediterranean routes. And uh, for especially for Serbia and for Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, this crisis uh, at the moment, because the people, migrants are transiting and walking around uh, 
throughout the, the country. Uh, so it starts to look like a humanitarian crisis. And the second issue, which is, is also important, it's a topic of political interest for parties, groups, and movements, especially on the right arena, so the right-wing uh, groups. And, uh, and uh, for example, in Serbia, uh, during the, the summer, there was an uh, election in Serbia, and actually one uh, uh, right-wing uh, movement or group of people actually used this uh, opportunity of migrant issue to to increase their visibility by uh, forming a so-called citizens patrol that will replace police and uh, check um, migrants uh, walking on the on the streets so that's for me now if you have any questions i'm available after this uh, this meeting or you can also approach me uh, by email or or phone thanks Thanks, Lucia. I hope I did it my 10 minutes. That was great. Thank you very much, Sasha. That was a really interesting whistle-stop tour into the current and shifting um, dynamics of human smuggling in the Western Balkans region. Um, so now we'll turn to the Q&A for all speakers. Um, First, I'll quickly uh, respond to um, a couple of comments and then I have a few questions for the other speakers. So firstly, thank you very much, Steve, for um, sharing your comments. And as you note, uh, human smuggling has been around for a long time. However, in many regions in Africa, it wasn't until the last 20 or 10 years that there was a criminal legal structure that criminalized that smuggling economy. Prior to that, it operated more as an informal economy, sometimes with civil sanctions, aiding and abetting irregular migration. So in, in some countries where that law has then been passed and enforcement has started, that's where the smuggling economy began, began to be um, treated as more of a criminal economy. And of course, the smuggling protocol is an organized crime criminal justice instrument, which um, seeks to focus on organized crime networks involved in human smuggling. And of course, there are those, some of which you flag. Um, and also, as Sasha has noted, that organized crime is certainly involved in areas of human smuggling. And it's key to focus resources and law enforcement operations on those dynamics and away from lower level um, smuggling, which does not fit the same criteria. Um, now, Veronica, um, you, you mentioned quite a few risks that um, arise from these dynamics of self-censorship in this context of growing surveillance. And I wondered if you could um, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on some key changes um, that you feel could be adopted in the system to try and avoid those risks that you identify. I think, um, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think it's a really complex question because the objectives are, of course, uh, controversial. Um, uh, we have also, on the, as Sasha mentioned, there are several aspects of this, uh, of this social phenomena. Um, and uh, it depends on which stakeholders objective you are taking as a core concern. So of course, the National Intelligence Service has a completely different concern uh, than a migration office compared to a humanitarian NGO uh, or the EU as such, or uh, uh, any kind of other stakeholders in service provision world who are actually willing to facilitate a stable internet network for all kinds of users. Just think of this 5G discussion. But I think the core uh, aspect where we really can work on is the way of our transparency. Uh, and our transparency from different angles. So, for instance, when you look at the, the Turkish narratives now of refugees, or actually the narratives of refugees in Turkey uh, feeling getting stuck there, uh, consider the Greek policies as deterrence practices in place of uh, just proper responses to, to the refugee flows they are facing from their perspective. So when these kind of narratives are increasing, uh, the suspicion and fear of people, which is actually unfunded in many cases because it's about misinformation. In a, in, it, it, it's a layer of all kinds of different uh, inputs and lack of reliable responses. So if I think there would be much more uh, coherent information resources and uh, 
proper law enforcement practices in terms of responding uh, on the state corporate relationship on a really transparent way in terms of vulnerabilities. I mean, we have to admit it. The current law enforcement strategies considering the digital data sharing practices are really problematic in general, not just in terms of the refugees, but also in terms of our daily administration and bureaucracies that are unable to keep up with technological um, explosions uh, uh, that are exploited by different corporates already. So I think those are the angles where we can really think about how to create a more predictable, but more secure, more efficient, but more transparent system in order to avoid this kind of fears of misconceptions by surveillance, because these are those, those assumptions and those fears that are creating actually uh, the, the, the decisions that create, as you have been describing, those kind of risk-taking activities uh, that we are facing in the last two, three years. Thank you, Veronica. Um, and now, Sasha, two questions um, towards you, please. Um, firstly, have you seen a shift um, regarding the nationality of smugglers? So between that of the um, kind of host communities and perhaps more towards the nationalities of those that are on the move. And then secondly, um, you mentioned the criminal networks involved in human smuggling. And do you see an overlap um, in the networks that are also involved in other crime types as well as human smuggling? And in particular, how often are we seeing a crossover with human trafficking? Uh, uh, thank you, Lucia, for a question. So first of all, uh, about the shift. Uh, so basically in 2015, uh, at the beginning of the migrant crisis and during the migrant crisis, so basically most of the organized crime uh, groups uh, were regional, so based uh, from the Western Balkans. But actually, right now it's a mix. So the nationality is not uh, only like uh, the people that are smugglers from the Western Balkans uh, uh, region, but it's also like a mix. So you can find out uh, people from Syria, Afghanistan, also dealing uh, with uh, the local uh, organized crime uh, groups that that actually uh, are, uh, are 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 uh, dealing with the uh, legal migration, with the, the, the smuggling of people to the to European Union states. So, but it's also different stories. So, basically, if we heard from the official authorities, for example, from the police or from from migration authorities in the Western Balkans they will say that actually the, the trend that uh, the people with origin from Syria, Afghanistan are actually uh, leaders in, uh, uh, in smuggling people from, uh, from their people from uh, their countries to the European Union. But I think it's uh, the, the, the truth is somewhere in between that is a, is a mix. And what is also known that people inside the organized crime group that are dealing with uh, the smuggling, so they actually know who is uh, responsible for, I don't know, for paying, who is responsible for uh, uh, for crossing the, the border, etc. So there is a strictly divisions of roles. So basically, they also very often uh, use like a local uh, person that actually don't know that are part of some uh, organized crime uh, activities to like uh, uh, do internal transit of uh, migrants through some some of the some of the countries in, in the region, and for the second uh, part, uh, for I know for Serbia and Montenegro, I'm not so sure about the whole region, but uh, it's not like the uh, the 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 business of uh, smuggling people is not like a top uh, top job for the organized crime groups. For example, in Serbia, uh, more than 70 percent, 75 percent of organized crime groups with origin for Serbia are dealing with the drug trafficking. So most of them are they are polycliminar, so me meaning that they are working on different uh, different jobs, but there are not so uh, clear evidence that basically that some organized crime groups that are working on the smuggling of people are actually dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, drug trafficking. So, so probably there are some, but it's not like, uh, like the top uh, priority so to say so thank you um to respond to ben carpenter carpenter's question um which is 
as I said at the beginning of the presentation, that two key crimes coming out of migration are people smuggling and human trafficking. And is there a reason why we have focused on human smuggling? I suppose there are two limbs of the answer to that, although fellow speakers also feel free to jump in. I would say partly it is just to do with um, the focus of the work of the speakers. Um, but partly perhaps also because human smuggling is intrinsically linked to irregular migration, while um, human trafficking, of course, can be linked, but can also exist separately to migration and, of course, can, can, can uh, occur domestically without any crossing of national borders and affect vulnerable populations that are not um, migrants and refugees. Um, and perhaps that's also um, part of the reason. Now, uh, Veronica, another question towards you is, um, do you expect or have you already started to see a shift in the dynamics you have been exploring in the wake of the pandemic? Do you mean a shift in terms of mobility traces or decision making? What type of decision making practices you mean? Um, both in how the decisions made, but also in the, some of the surveillance um, techniques that you have described, whether you feel like shifts in migration policy means they will be used differently. Oh, there is a clear, I mean, if you follow the current cases, especially the focus on uh, the tradition, I mean, what Sasha described and also that this kind of practices along the borders, the hard, the hard borders, uh, and the differentiation between uh, preventing people arriving, what you see now in the Italian case, the Spanish case, uh, uh, Canary Islands. Uh, um, so the Frontex practices of holding boats back to, to be able to arrive to a particular place. Those, those are obviously uh, responses which are really different. What, what has a kind of, what creates a particular perception of risk which, the, which already uh, shifts the decision-making processes of people in terms of um, modus operandi, but in terms of fears. For instance, when I started this research that people were who were taking ships, um, nuts boats, big ships in containers from Turkey to England and Italy was for me difficult to imagine. Now it's a much more regular practice what we can discuss because people are really avoiding the traditional Balkan route as, as it has been discussed before. And these decisions are generally associated not with the local surveillance practices, but because people extend their knowledge about how the, uh, the profiling attributes, which are actually adjusted in this kind of surveillance practices, uh, are shaping their potential future. So they are more and more, of course, there is an increasing awareness of the surveillance practices and the post potential implication of uh, the final decision makers in host countries. Uh, there is an increased, uh, increasing paranoia about the potential uh, label of uh, terrorist uh, or radical religious uh, affiliation of uh, particular people coming from conflict countries like Syria. Um, there is an, so our social construction of the refugee in the West and how that has been implemented through this algorithmic thinking and data collaboration practices through all kinds of national and subnational and ultranational um, surveillance structures and state of uh, non-state or uh, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, there are many layers of this kind of data exchange practice. But the more these, they, these kind of narratives and values in particular are infiltrated uh, into these systems, the more they impact the way how uh, the people also start to see and perceive uh, the, the, the filtering and the profiling attributes of these uh, border control measures. So everything which has been constructed in, in social political narratives is slowly dropping down through this kind of uh, experiences and information sharing and in particular the emotional aspect of fears about information sharing among refugees themselves. So I think that's the key. Uh, what I noticed at this moment and the fear of political affiliation, visible political affiliation that creates a particular 
new form of self-censorship comparing to 2015-16. Thank you. I think the pandemic really has had um, really deep impacts across the board. And uh, Sasha, I thought to pick up slightly on one of the uh, dynamics that you had tracked, which was that um, that temporary decrease. And if, as you said, you know, um, Frontex saw record low figures in terms of um, detections on irregular crossings around March and April. And then you noted that in some of the uh, Western Balkans borders, those figures have been creeping up again and uh, in some cases higher than pre-pandemic levels. And I think it's it's important to embed that within um, kind of a broader context and note that that similar kind of crashing down and then slowly climbing back up really has been happening in many regions across the world. So, for example, um, it, it occurred for with um, irregular emigration from Algeria and Tunisia, which suffered a very deep drop. And then, you know, uh, volumes got swollen again, moving forwards. But also, interestingly, to jump to a completely different part of the world. Um, similarly, uh, in Guatemala, as movements uh, restrictions started to be eased in late July, the irregular migration towards the United States um, increased sharply, as did detections on the border and deportations. And if we take the kind of overall US border patrol apprehensions across the border with Mexico, we again track this um, significant drop initially in March and April, and then a re-escalation from May onwards and exceeding pre-pandemic figures by September. So I, th I think it's interesting to kind of take what you're, you've been seeing in the Western Balkans and identify that those shifts and changes have been seen in a number of different areas. And um, Sasha, a question for you is, Clearly, um, these migration routes have existed for a very long time. And, but however, particularly the route through Bosnia has perhaps increased in prominence more recently. Could you talk us through a little bit as to why that route in particular has um, gained so much prominence? Yes, so basically besides that uh, drop, uh, there is another uh, element that is most common with the, the practice of uh, smuggling of people uh, in the Western Balkans, when we compare to other parts of the world, the, the other element is like uh, police and uh, customs corruption. So that's also like uh, very visible on the US-Mexico border, but it's also visible in this part of the region. And uh, why Bosnia-Herzegovina? The reason is quite simply. So basically the, uh, the Hungary, uh, stricter border very, very much. So they're their border are very hard to, to, to cross over. And basically people trying to find out another route. So it's not like possible to go uh, throughout uh, Romania because the, the terrain is not so easy to cross because of the huge mountains, etc. And the Bosnia Herzegovina is better. So it basically they, they, they use uh, people from uh, uh, from Hungary go to the Bosnia and actually from Bosnia go to the Croatia. And the Croatian problem was uh, that's, that's the alternative uh, route. And uh, the also what we have also uh, like uh, a practice in, uh, for Croatia especially is that uh, very uh, not so professional uh, behavior of police officers uh, towards uh, migrants and that was topic also uh, raised in the European Parliament, also in the European Commission uh, because of the police brutality. So right now, for example, in some parts of the Bosnia Herzegovina, there are camps with, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 people. And because I said that it's like a humanitarian crisis. So especially right now, it will be very difficult because winter is coming <laughs> and uh, that will be, I think, uh, quite uh, quite difficult to arrange everything on the space, especially because if something uh, wrong pop up with the Turkey and we have another migration influx from from there. Thank you, um, Sasha. I I used the phrase "winter is coming" once, and I was asked 
why I was trying to um, reference well-known TV programs. So I, I suspect that's why there was that smile there. Um, and a question from the audience, which is um, focused on why, which other shifts have we seen perhaps in smuggling practices in the face of the pandemic? And I, I thought I'd leap in here with um, one that I have found particularly fascinating, which is that um, in, in some contexts, as the obstacles to moving people have increased, because there's been both the domestic movement restrictions, but also border closures and the funneling of more resources into borders. Some networks that had previously been focusing on moving um, people responded to, the, to these additional risks and restrictions by leveraging networks to smuggle goods instead, really showing how um, networks can kind of leverage their operations to move whatever is required in some areas. Um, and so, in, in some context, this was to meet a new demand for legal um, commodities, but where the supply chain had been disrupted by COVID trade restrictions or um, other goods that had been rendered illegal by new practices. So we saw, for example, the banning of alcohol and cigarettes by some states and the immediate burgeoning illegal economies that sprung around that and um, some facilitated by those that had been moving people. And this has been reported in regions as diverse as Niger, where smugglers confirmed switching um, from moving humans to moving goods and fuels from Libyan cities in the south to gold fields in northern Chad to avoid the increased risk of moving people. And also um, reported in Thailand, for example, where um, some gemstone traders um, have been using networks that typically smuggled people to move their wares um, instead. So those are two um, kind of shifts that really show the flexibility of these uh, networks um, that I found particularly interesting. Um, so uh, thank you very much um, to Veronica and also to Sasha for joining us today and for um, giving us these really interesting insights into extremely complex um, topics. I really encourage um, the audience to uh, dive into some of the publications that have been shared um, to find out a little bit more about the research. Um, and thank you also um, to our audience for engaging with us today. Um, migration and organized crime is obviously an extremely topical subject, one that is very much in a state of flux and above all, it's extremely important to keep discussing, keep talking about it, keep questioning approaches and making sure that we're really moving towards those that appropriately respond to the criminal dynamics of the markets, but also safeguard the rights of irregular refugees and migrants on the move. Thank you very much, everyone. You were listening to Migration and Organised Crime. If you'd like to get more information on this topic and the speakers, head over to the conference website, oc24.globalinitiative.net. There you can also find videos of most of the talks, including a number of discussions that are not part of this podcast series. This was the 24-hour conference on Global Organised Crime podcast. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.